Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Well, the province has just announced new steps to strengthen protections for landlords and renters. We'll discuss that first and ask how do we ensure the rights of both are protected and in turn, both sides live by the rules. In half an hour, a new BC book tells the story of a spirited fifth grader who has ADHD. We'll speak with the author and we're asking, what's your experience raising a child with ADHD? And if you live with ADHD, what do you want people to know? I'm Michelle Elliott. Welcome to BC Today. Thank you for joining us on CBC Radio 1, CBC Television, and live streaming on the CBC News app, cbc.ca slash bc, and on the CBC Vancouver YouTube page. And you can call us right now on our top story. What's needed to better protect tenants and landlords in BC? You can call 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. Hit pound 690 on your cell phone. You can also email us, bctoday at cbc.ca. You can send a text to 236-330-2623. Will renter and landlord disputes just add more stress to BC's rental housing crisis? Now, the province says it's taking steps to offer better protections for both. Housing Minister Ravi Kalon has just announced he's tabling legislation that would protect tenants from bad faith evictions. It would eliminate rent increases when a child is added to a household. And they're taking steps to speed up the dispute resolution process at the residential tenancy branch. And we are asking you on the open line, what is needed to protect landlords and tenants? And how can we ensure that the rules are enforced? You can call 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. Hit pound 690 on your cell phone. Our email is bctoday at cbc.ca. Well, for more on this, Premier David Eby did begin a press conference just about half an hour ago, and here he is explaining what is in the proposed legislation and why the bill is being introduced. Some of the solution is really uh, what we introduced today in a new uh, law in front of the legislature, uh, making sure that we're providing those protections and addressing some of the excesses we've seen. People will have seen the story a few months ago of a woman who had a baby who was a renter uh, getting a notice of a $600 rent increase because she added a new tenant to the home by having a child. Uh, this bill that we introduced in the legislature will address those issues, making sure that if you have a kid and you're a renter, you're not going to see a significant rent increase. We also know that there's a significant number of people in the province that are paying below market rents. They're uh, protected by our limits on rent increases. And, uh, and there is a huge temptation on the part of some landlords to evict those tenants and replace them with another tenant uh, that would be paying a much higher market rate. Uh, what we're seeing is some landlords using the personal use exemption, saying, hey, I'm gonna use this suite, uh, evicting somebody, uh, and then living there briefly, and then moving in somebody at a higher rent rate. Uh, it's an issue that's been raised for us by the seniors advocate, among others, and this bill also addresses this issue takes uh, action to address uh, some of the uh, mechanisms uh, that some landlords are using here. For example, increasing the amount of notice that the landlord has to give in these situations, increasing the amount of time that the unit has to be used personally by the landlord before it can be rented out to somebody else, and increasing uh, uh, the period of time uh, that, uh, that a tenant has to dispute a notice to go to the residential tenancy branch if they feel that the rules weren't properly being uh, followed. On the landlord side, uh, uh, Minister Kalon, the housing minister, will go into more detail. But we have uh, uh, taken steps to address long wait times at the residential tenancy branch, reducing those by more than 50% uh, in the last year by adding additional staff and adding new guidelines and flexibility around problem tenants and, uh, and increasing the ability to remove them quickly and effectively at the residential tenancy branch. That is Premier David Eby speaking just in the last half hour. We are asking you on the open line, what do you think is needed to better protect landlords and tenants in BC? And how can we ensure the enforcement of the rules? You can call us 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733, pound 690 on your cell phone. You can also uh, dial us up or email us rather, bctoday at cbc.ca. Let's go to a caller now in Vernon. And uh, welcome to you, Larissa. 
Hi, thanks Hi. for having me on. Sure, yes. Tell us uh, what, what you think of uh, what's just being announced. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's kind of um, good common sense policy, I guess, to have a functioning RTB. Um, it seems like right now we're quite far from that. With the residential the tenancy branch. Yeah, mm. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I personally have heard kind of some horror stories, but also just a lot of, um, you know, anxiety from homeowners who maybe would rent a suite, for example, but choose not to because they are so concerned that if they do get a bad renter in, that they will, will not be able to get them out uh, within a reasonable time frame. And I think that this goes to the question of people trusting public institutions, essentially, right? People need to feel that if there are rules and mechanisms for enforcement in place, that they actually work in practice. Um, and I don't think that's how people feel about the RTV right now. Mm. And tell me more about what you're hearing. Um, it, it, and this is from, I presume, from people who would be landlords if they did trust that the system was functioning properly. Yeah. Um, I have a neighbor, for example, who for decades has operated um, uh, like SROs or, or rooming houses and now, you know, transitioning to, for example, supportive housing. Mm. And for them, you know, the, the likelihood that they do possibly end up with a problem tenant is higher. I mean, it's not always. They have a lot of great tenants, too, um, that they, you know, really, who they really enjoy. Um, but it only takes one bad tenant and one really bad experience to break that trust with the system, right? And they're providing exactly the type of housing for, for people really on the margins that cannot afford any other type, right, of accommodation. Mm. And, um, and is it about the weights, Larissa, or about how the dispute is actually um, resolved in the end? Um, I mean, probably the weight is the biggest thing. Mm. I, I can't remember exactly how long it took, but mm. it's also just all the costs. Like, there's... As far as I understand, there's lots of costs associated with getting someone out that, you know, it's not just making a case at the RTB. It's you actually have to pay for a sheriff to remove them. And then you, uh, you have to store their things for a certain amount of time or something. Anyways, um, okay. and it's, it's quite burdensome, right? That, and, and, you know, if someone damages it, the, um, the rental, you have a damage deposit, but damage can go way beyond damage deposits, and the RTB can rule that they owe money, but if they don't have money, they don't have money to pay, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, and, and Larissa, it's really good to hear from you. Thank you very much. And, you know, you touched on that wait at the residential tenancy branch, which is where the uh, dispute resolution would take place. There was an issue with long waits there. We heard from um, the CEO of Landlord BC last week on, on the coast, and, and he said that was an issue. Uh, there were long waits that were negative, uh, you know, had consequences for both landlords and tenants, and uh, he said that was because of the pandemic. Um, now, the province says since November 2022, wait times at, at the residential tenancy branch have been reduced by almost 54% um, from... 10 and a half weeks in February 2023 to less than five weeks in February 2024. So just uh, uh, just over a month ago. And so they're saying that those wait times have improved. Um, and that's part of, in fact, of the announcement today. They're taking more steps to um, expedite the process at the residential tenancy branch. Thanks so much for giving us that picture um, from Vernon Larissa. Good to hear from you. And our number again is 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. And Housing Minister Ravi Kalon did speak as well, along with the Premier, and he provided more details about how the proposed changes would actually operate. We know that most landlords and tenants uh, act in good faith. Uh, but there are those uh, on both ends of the spectrum that continue to put challenges on the system and we need to make sure that we have things in place to protect them. These actions today we're introducing will ensure that there's greater clarity for both tenants and landlords as we move forward. 
when evicting for personal use, we know uh, that landlords now, with this new change, will be required to submit a notice to end tenancy through the RTV's new web portal. This new web portal will ensure that landlords understand the requirements when they evict a tenant, are they aware of the financial risk uh, when they're evicting in bad faith. They have, uh, they'll be required to sign a declaration uh, when they're doing so. And also it'll enable government to be able to collect information so that we can get a good sense of how much uh, how much evictions we're seeing, in particular for personal use, because that data right now does not exist. We're also introducing a ban on evictions for personal use in buildings where the buildings have five or more units. Because we know that in particularly uh, a problem with multi-rental units, there we've seen a lot of long-term tenants being targeted for personal use eviction. Owners already have the ability through turnover to secure suites for caretakers and they don't need to evict the tenants that are currently living there. We're also making changes to protect renters, in particular long-term renters who sometimes get targeted. Seniors fixed on, uh, with fixed incomes, particularly vulnerable seniors, because when they lose their homes, uh, we know that many of them lived in homes for a long time. When they lose their homes, it's more likely that they're on the pathway to finding themselves homeless. In fact, the seniors advocate has raised this alarm to us uh, that uh, it's a real concern that we're seeing more seniors being evicted from long-term tenancies who are finding themselves trying to get in the market and finding only very expensive affordable units available for them and, and many of them finding themselves in very precarious housing situations because of it. We also are making some changes to support landlords. In the past uh, few years, we've seen a real increase in cases coming to the RTB and a real backlog. Uh, this is not a challenge only in British Columbia. This is a challenge, in fact, being seen across the country. The only difference is in British Columbia, we've taken action. We're seeing a 50% plus decline in wait times for uh, cases to be heard at the RTB, which is uh, significant. In fact, for unpaid rent cases, we've created a new expedited process and we're seeing 57% drop in uh, wait times for unpaid rent, which is substantial and very important. I know that landlords have raised uh, with us. The changes also give us the authority to prescribe additional grounds for ending problem problematic tenancies. Uh, we've heard from landlords that there's real challenges. Uh, RTB wait times, which we're addressing, uh, unpaid um, uh, rents is a, is a challenge, and we've taken action with the Money Judgment Act that was passed by the Attorney General uh, last fall, which will be coming into effect late this year, early next year, which will help landlords and tenants to be able to get the payments that they're paid, that they're due, in a much, much more timely manner. And all of this uh, is in, 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 in conjunction with the important work we're doing, the the work that we're doing uh, leading the country on getting an increased housing supply. That's Housing Minister Ravi Kalan speaking in the last hour in Victoria. So a lot uh, that he went through there, but some of the new measures that they're adding to legislation um, in order to protect both renters and landlords, he said that uh, to try and deter bad faith evictions, landlords will be required to uh, go to a web portal to generate a notice to evict a tenant, and this would be for personal use. And so this new process for evictions would allow for compliance audits as well to try and stop um, bad faith or unfair evictions. And he said that would help with collecting data as well when it comes to those evictions. He talked about cutting the wait times at the residential tenancy branch to get through those dispute, uh, dispute resolution processes. And as well, he talked about adding additional grounds for ending a tenancy, that for the landlords. So among all that, we're asking you, what are the protections that are needed for landlords and tenants in BC? How can we ensure enforcement of the rules? Asking you on the open line, 1-800-825-5950, 604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. And in a few minutes, we'll hear from CBC's provincial affairs reporter, Mira Baines, who's in Victoria uh, at that press conference. Mark is our next caller in New Westminster. Hi, Mark. Welcome. Hello. Hi there. Uh, what do you think is needed to protect landlords and tenants? 
Well, so, you know, the situation is, 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 is not very good for poor tenants in this province, and, uh, and I've been thinking about this for a long time. And the other day I was pondering about this, what solution could we come, could we come up with? Mm. And I came up with a very similar solution as the minister did, which a, a registry where landlord would be required to register for evicting a tenant, and then they would be required to keep that place to themselves for a certain amount of time and all this. And while that systematically would work, uh, I think the problem is that, the, the first, the, the, the landlords are unscrupulous, and that's what the problem is to, to begin with. And well, so, that, well, you would say so some, this, some landlords. The same unscrupulous landlord will now evict you, register, evict a tenant, and then will go and find a desperate tenant, desperate for housing, and move him in without any contract. I'm look. If you want housing, you can move in with no contract. Hmm. And then at the end of the year, there'll be a whole shit show to get them out. And that okay. will create more insecurity for that tenant while he has no contract. And because, the, because really, it's, it's because of the landlord's been unscrupulous that we have this situation of rent hiking, hiking, and right. eviction. Mark, just so I so follow you correct, just so I follow you correctly here, and, and our listeners follow you as well, there's a part of this announcement uh, that would increase the amount of notice, um, pardon me, increase the amount of time that a landlord must occupy a rental unit after they've ended a tenancy for personal use for personal occupancy so that would go from six months to 12 months essentially not being able to rent it out um to you know not to being able to just turn around and rent it out at market rate um quickly and what you're saying is this may um then generate or encourage an unscrupulous landlord to then just uh you know rent it out under under the table so well, to speak well the current six months how is this monitored it's monitored by mm. the rental tenancy branch i imagine they, they make sure okay it's not re-rented so you can complain if there's no you know that's all they monitor. but so how is the monitoring monitoring done so is it really empty is it really used by the family is it not so the, the fact that you increase it from six months to a year even if you put it 10 years how will this be monitored mm. and and be kept in check so that unscrupulous landlord don't actually move in somebody under the table mm. under the radar for, to still make their money, and after that, and after that, you move somebody okay. back in, and then back, back and forth like this. That's yeah. my opinion. Thank you very much uh, for that, Love. Mark, uh, for, for raising that concern. Um, the press release, anyway, says there will be an audit, uh, a post eviction compliance audit. That is going to be the new process for evictions. But what he's saying there is how do you enforce, how do you uh, keep track of uh, compliance when it comes to landlords not renting out? within the time frame um, that they're not allowed to do so that they have to uh, occupy that uh, unit that they've just evicted someone from. Mark, thank you very much for the call. Andrew is next in in Vancouver. Hi, Andrew. Thanks so much. And you've just moved here from Alberta. Is that right? No, that's not correct. Okay. I'm in my suite now as I speak. You look wonderful on TV. Uh, but I've been in this particular building since 1987. Okay. And my landlord, the new landlord that came from Alberta, um, doesn't like me and a few other tenants. In fact, they tried to rent evict me okay. because of the fact that I'm at a pretty inexpensive rate, as a few of us are. Keep in mind, 1987 is a lot of years to be in one particular suite. Sure. The concern that I have, though, is I do have a copy of my original agreement, and I think there needs to be an organized, informed way that when tenants sign an agreement with a landlord for that particular address, that information is sent somewhere that can be an overseer to make sure that all the information has continuity. I also feel that we should have the same kind of rules and benefits across the Canada, the provinces and their territories. For someone to get away with what they were doing in Alberta to the tenants, they then came here to Vancouver to try to do the same things. And fortunately for us, we do have some protections that mm. are wonderful. I, I encourage the governments to continue to be observant to these issues, to be fair to tenants and landlords. That is a really interesting point, Andrew. Thank you very much. I'm just quickly looking up, uh, I believe, last week when the Prime Minister announced this uh, renter's bill of rights, you know, part of it was announcing a standard lease agreement, um, a, a national standard lease agreement um, across the country. Uh, so that may be part of what you're talking about. But the other part, uh, which is also quite interesting, is to be able to send that to an overseeing body, a third party that would, I, I guess it sounds like you're saying, monitor and ensure that it is being abided by. Thanks so much for the call. Really interesting. And uh, Stephen is our next caller now in Campbell River. What's needed to protect landlords and tenants, Stephen? 
Uh, morning, uh, Michelle. Um, I'm, a, I'm a landlord myself, and I was just saying, you know, if the government wants to uh, bring down the cost of rent, you realise when I replace my mortgage, I get, a, I get charged an extra 1% one, one or 1.5%, maybe even 2% on my mortgage for a rental. When I go to insure my property, I'm paying double the insurance rate because uh, the insurance companies want more money. And then uh, when I go and pay my property tax, I don't get any discount because it's a rental. Now, if you want to bring down the cost of renting, have a go at these people because all those expenses get, get added on to the, uh, the rent. Okay, so you're uh, right now within um, within a year. There's a limit to how much you, as a landlord, can increase the rent to. I think it's three point four percent this year. What are you saying that that should be higher, or three point five percent rather? Well, I'm saying if uh, if the insurance companies are allowed to double my insurance rate because it's a rental, mm -hmm. the uh, the banks are allowed to charge another one and a half percent because it's a mortgage on a rental, mm. then uh, maybe make the banks uh, keep the mortgage rate the same for uh, a house, uh, for a landlord and uh, his rental property. And then the council can also uh, reduce the council tax because it's a rental. They, they want more rental properties. Mm. Then uh, stop charging uh, full price on the, on the council tax to or help, the property tax. To help landlords who would be uh, filling in the gaps in, in rental housing. Stephen, also an interesting point. Thank you so much from Campbell River. Uh, that's Stephen joining us. Uh, right now, CBC's provincial affairs reporter Mira Baines is on the line. She has been at the press conference in Victoria. We're going to hear from her in just a moment. This is BC Today here on CBC Radio 1. And more coverage of this issue this afternoon here on CBC. If you are in uh, the Victoria area and on Vancouver Island, you'll hear more coming up on All Points West. And here's host Jason D'Souza. Hi, Michelle. It's Jason D'Souza here from All Points West on Vancouver Island. Today, well, BC has made yet another housing announcement. This time, it's promising new protections for tenants from unfair evictions. We're going to hear from BC's housing minister. Ravi Kalan will join us on the program this afternoon. And a true crime series launching soon is based on a murder that changed Greater Victoria forever. We know that true crime has become all the rage in recent times, but what impact does fictionalized accounts like this one have on the real family, friends, neighbours, community members who are left behind who remember these events all too well? Well, we're going to have that conversation coming up as well on the show. Jason, thank you very much. Very interesting there on uh, on podcasts as well and true crime. But uh, back to the issue of renter and landlord protection. Some emails now coming in. Joanne writes from Victoria, when government brings in legislative bills, they very seldom have teeth because the rules are not enforced. I'm interested to see how many housing units are returned to housing when short-term rentals ends May 1st, when those restrictions come in, and when we could see an influx of units to help this shortage. And until the federal government re reduces the number of immigrants or till our housing, health and education infrastructure catch up. Just this morning, the prime minister announced $6 billion for infrastructure. It is too little, too late. Thank you very much for your emails. BC Today at cbc.ca. For more on this morning's announcement from the province, CBC's provincial affairs reporter Mira Baines joins me now. Hi, Mira. Hi, Michelle. Busy morning. What stands out for you and what you heard today? That's right. I'm in a lovely park in Fernwood uh, in the Victoria area. And uh, this is a community where you do see a lot of renters. And so in this announcement, uh, the, the government really focused on closing the loopholes around renter protection. Now, one of the things dealt with uh, purpose-built rentals. And uh, Housing Minister Ravi Kalan says evicting people from um, uh, these types of 
purpose-built rentals. These are rentals in, in, in larger apartment buildings, um, have been a, a, a fast way to evict uh, renters, especially seniors. And so they wanted to close a loophole involving these. And so, so one of the, the, the amendments will deal with landlords being banned from evicting tenants for their own personal occupancy in these types of buildings. Mm. And for other types of properties, for suites, condos, a landlord will have to submit a new online declaration using a porthole for personal use evictions. We have seen a lot of personal use evictions where a landlord says um, uh, a family member is moving in uh, and then sometimes a tenant finds out that in fact a, a, a family member did not move in. And so uh, under, the, uh, under the new rules, what the government is also planning on doing is also increasing uh, the time that uh, one of these personal use uh, rentals is taking right. place. So from six months to 12 months. And so that's pretty significant. And also through this online portal, because um, the, the landlord will have to submit a form uh, through this online portal, the ministry can keep track of exactly how many times the landlord is doing this and for what purposes. And also then they can be audited as well. So that is pretty significant and then and just another loophole that they're trying to close is um, uh, landlords will be uh, banned from increasing rents uh, for if, if let's say, uh, a family adds another uh, family member mm. under the age of 19. So let's say a couple has a baby. Uh, and so a landlord will not be able to increase the rent in, in those types of cases. Right. And Premier David Eby referred to uh, a high profile case that was in the news uh, a few months ago. Mira, a, a lot there to digest. Thank you so much for going through it with us. And I know that uh, the housing minister, Ravi Kalon, will be on all points west on Vancouver Island this afternoon. So stay tuned for that and lots more to come from Mira Baines. Thank you, Mira. Uh, it is now 12.32, 1.32 in the Mountain Time Zone. This is BC Today, a very busy morning, of course, on the rental housing front. Much more to come on that story uh, in the news and on your afternoon shows wherever you are in the province. And coming up in our next half hour here on our program, we're going to take your calls on what you would like to be like people to know um, if you live with ADHD. We have an author joining us who's written a book that features uh, a fifth grader, a grade five student who is living with ADHD and what her life is like in school. We'll hear more about that book and also take your calls. That's coming up after the CBC News Update. And here's Robert Zimmerman. <laughs> Good afternoon. Child care providers in B.C. can no longer charge a fee to families looking to be added to their wait list. The province says some providers were charging non-refundable fees between $25 and $200 to hold a spot. Child care advocates have called wait list fees a cash grab. As we've been hearing on the show, the provincial government is introducing legislation it says will better protect renters. The new rules will restrict rent increases if tenants have rented a space and later have a child. Premier David Eby says the rules will also prevent some landlords from taking advantage of personal occupancy provisions. And for the first time in a decade, more Canadians left B.C. last year than arrived here from other provinces. Statistics Canada says close to 68,000 people left for other parts of the country, including about 40,000 who crossed into Alberta. Despite the decline in interprovincial migration, the population of B.C. rose above 5.8 million last year. And now the forecast. The rainfall warning continues for sections of the central coast. On the north coast, showers this afternoon with strong winds and a high of 7. Highs to 15 with a chance of showers in the peace. In the central interior, showers this afternoon with a high of 12 degrees. Highs up to 19 with a mix of sun and cloud in the Kootenays. In the southern interior, mainly cloudy with a high of 20. And cloudy in Greater Victoria this afternoon. Rain in Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Valley. Windy in some areas areas with highs around 15. That's your CBC News update from Vancouver. Thank you very much, Rob. And uh, lots more on the landlord and tenant uh, protections announced this morning, of course. Uh, Nicole is calling us now in the South Okanagan. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Yes, can you go me? ahead. What's, what's, you, you're both a landlord and tenant, I understand. I am, mm. yeah. I've got over a dozen rental units. 
and uh, and I'm also a renter myself. I'm a tenant myself. Okay. So what do you th- what protections are needed? Um, you know, I got to tell you, I'm pretty frustrated. Like as a as a renter, I feel quite protected. I I know the rules and regulations. I know I can't be evicted. I know I have a lease agreement. I know as soon as I pay my damage deposit, I'm entitled to that space. Um, but as a landlord, I feel so uh, unempowered. I feel so frustrated when you get into a situation where you have somebody legitimately damaging your investment, um, ca- you know, causing damage, threatening other room, uh, other rentals within the building or whatever. Are there not um, enough, and there aren't enough um, rules or grounds that enable you to, to uh, evict? There just aren't. And mm. on top of that, they're saying, oh, well, so you submit an application for whatever it is, owner use, whatever. Mm. Um, we're going to give the tenant more time. We're going to give them more time to respond to that. And then maybe instead of doing two months, you have to have three months, four months notice. But don't worry. We've cut our wait times in half at RTV. Mm-hmm. Well, my last wait time was six months. Six months. And they've cut like, that down to five weeks. <laughs> I hope so. Mm. I mean, that's not that's not the feedback that I've been getting. I'm mm. on a private landlord group. We support each other. We ensure everybody's following okay. the rules and regulations, like on Facebook. I, I hear um, you. I hear you, Nicole. Thank you very much. I do have to move on. My apologies, but thank you very much for sharing that. The frustration of uh, a landlord trying to go through the residential Tennessee branch dispute process. It is 12.36 now, 1.36 in the Mountain Time Zone. Thanks for joining us here on BC Today. We're on CBC Radio 1, live streaming as well on CBC News app, cbc.ca slash bc, and the CBC Vancouver YouTube page. You can catch us on CBC Television as well. Thanks for joining us there. You can call us now on our second topic as well. We're going to talk about uh, life, uh, living with ADHD and raising a child with ADHD. If you have experience with that, I'd love to hear from you. What's your experience raising your child? And if you live with ADHD, what do you want people to know? You can call us 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone as well. And you can also email bctoday at cbc.ca or text us 236-330-2623. And yes, perhaps we're all getting into our regular routines after spring break. Uh, But for some kids who live with ADHD, there can be some more challenges. And so we are taking your calls on that as well. We're going to hear the story of uh, a a fictional child in this book we're going to talk about in a moment. But again, our numbers are 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. Love to hear your personal experiences. And joining me now in our studio is West Vancouver author Chris Reed. And Chris's new book is about a 10-year-old girl who lives with ADHD. It is called Queenie Jean is in Trouble Again. It is published today. Chris, welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Oh, my goodness. Very exciting time. I understand this was a labor of love. Absolutely. (laughs) Over 10 years. Um, and I personally do not have ADHD, so it was kind of a, a big leap for me in many ways, but I've had lots of great coaches and writing help and, and worked hard along the way, and I found the, pub- the perfect publisher with Heritage House. They yeah. love the story. And where does the inspiration come from? My background originally was in English and music, and then I kind of went, did another turn and got into math and accounting, and I did that for a long time. And then all of a sudden I decided after the pandemic and whatnot, okay, this is it. This is time to get my book in shape. I'm going to get it out there. And why did you want to tell the story of a child with ADHD? Well, when I, when my kids were young, I, I have a daughter with ADHD, so that was the inspiration. Um, there weren't a lot of books about ADHD. There still aren't, and especially featuring protagonists with ADHD, mm. and even fewer where it's told from first for person. So the story is totally through the eyes of Queenie. We know what she sees, what she thinks, what she says, and so it's a fully immersive experience, and that's what I was going for. And she is delightful. 
Thank you. I have you. to say, I mean, I was reading, leafing through it and I just thought, I love this kid. Um, and I think you have a page there that you're able to I read do. from. I think this just gives our audience a little bit of a sample of Queenie Jean. Um, sure. Would you do us the honors of reading from it? Absolutely. The thing is, I never try to get into trouble. Sometimes trouble just happens. And sometimes it sticks to me like that dumb wad of bubblegum in my hair. <laughs> Maybe it's because I have a weird name, or maybe it's because I have ADHD. Anyways, mom doesn't get it, and neither did the principal at my last school. I'm not sure the principal at this private school will understand either, or even Miss Smart, my new grade five teacher. Mrs. Payne, the very important principal of the junior school, looks so serious as she stands at the front door towering over the kids. She must be about 10 feet tall. She's wearing the same all black clothes she wore last week when we toured the school. I run right up in front of her and stop. Kids pour in through the doors on either side of us, all wearing the same pea green and gray uniform. Hey, Mrs. Payne, hi, remember me, Queenie? I whirl and dance and dance and whirl all around her because it feels good, because dancing helps me quash the wiggles and jiggles and dive bombers. Ah, Queenie, there you are. Mrs. Payne bends over and peers way, way down at me through her enormous black glasses. She could still be a nice person, right? Even if she is dressed all in black and as tall and skinny as a giraffe. Even if her short gray hair looks like a helmet for outer space travel. Mrs. Payne, isn't this just an awesome morning? And aren't you so happy to be alive even though you look like you're going to a funeral? I skip and jump and twirl around and around and all around me kids continue to zip into the school. Good morning, Queenie. Please settle down. Stop that dancing and jumping nonsense right now. You're preventing other children from entering our school, Mrs. Payne says sternly. But I'm just so excited to meet all the kids in my class and, and I wanna make lots of cool friends, especially girls. Well, a couple anyway. Okay, at least one super nice girl. Oh, there's so much just in those two pages, right? I also want to say there's an illustration yes. of the teacher of the very important principal, Mrs. Payne. She's wearing all black. Looks very fashionable, in fact. But I, yes. <laughs> I can see why to a young kid. That's just a little boring. But, you know, she starts there. She's saying I, I, um, uh, she's so excited to make friends. And it's really poignant, her saying at least one nice girl. Um, it can be challenging for any kid to make friends. Yes. But, uh, what does it mean for a child with ADHD? I think it's extra hard. And there are a number of reasons. Because, uh, first of all, ADHD is a neurodevelopment disorder or brain-based uh, disorder. And often these kids are relatively young compared to their peers. In fact, at age 10, Queenie comes across more like a seven-year-old. And that's pretty typical with kids with ADHD. So there's a big factor there. She's not at the same emotional level as, as the kids at the school. Um, she has a tendency to blurt everything out. Not every child is it likes that. Uh, you know, she tends to fly by the seat of the pants. Everything is now, now, now. And she has frequent meltdowns. So all of those things together can make it hard for these kids to really make connections with other kids. And 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 as far as your your comfortable, can you share with us? You know, Queenie Jean is not your 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 child, correct? Um, but you know, what's it like looking for resources? Um, well, you know, it's gotten better now because uh, my daughter was this age almost 20 years ago. Mm. So it has gotten better, but there's still a lot of misunderstanding out there. Um, you know, still in the school systems and, uh, you know, there, it's like anything else. There's some amazing teachers, but unfortunately, they're not given the tools. There's not a lot of, ta of uh, taught about ADHD. Um, so, and the Ministry of Education, unfortunately, doesn't recognize it as a disability or even recognize it that being subject to accommodations. So, it, it can be, as a parent, I mean, we were lucky enough to send a child to a private school, but a lot of parents can't do that. Sure. So, it, yes, there are resources. CADDAC.ca um, is a really great one. It's a Canadian organization for ADHD, but um, it can be really rough to access, you know, what is needed. 
Well, we'd love to hear from other parents out there. What's your experience raising your child with ADHD? And if you live with ADHD, what would you like other people to know? Uh, you can call us 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733, pound 690 on your cell phone. You can email bctoday at cbc.ca. My guest is author Chris Reed, whose new book is actually set in Vancouver and uh, it's uh, called Queenie Jean is in Trouble Again. Uh, let's take our first caller now, Chantel in Nanaimo. Hello, welcome. Hi, how are you? I am fine. Thanks very much for calling. What is it you'd like to say about ADHD? Um, well, I myself have ADHD, um, but I'm also the chair and co-founder of um, ADHD Advocacy Society of BC. Mm, um, we're relatively new. Um, we came out in 2022, um, and we're, we're, we're picking up a lot of steam now. Um, yeah, I have ADHD. My kids have ADHD. Everybody on our board has ADHD. Um, their kids have ADHD. I mean, it obviously, it runs through the family a lot. Um, we've decided to do that because there was no, like, um, voice specifically here in BC. Kadak does some amazing, amazing work. Um, we're in frequent touch with them, um, through our journey here. And, uh, but there wasn't anything specifically for BC mm. because there's some things that are just different here, right? And mm. how things are done in the different ministries. What's, um, what's different? But, what's different? Oh, uh, for example, the medication in Ontario for ADHD medication, it's all covered up until the age of 19 in Ontario, um, whereas here it's not. Um, there are many medications that are not covered. Um, At under all? The, yeah, yeah, hmm. unfortunately. Hmm. Um, some have extended medical, um, which will cover some of it or part of it. Um, but that's only if you're super lucky. Um, otherwise, you have to go on to a different plan and it's all income tested. And uh, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll make you try out short acting medications first instead of long acting, which is mm. what um, they are recommend now um, to this day uh, uh, that you have long acting ones. So you don't have to keep taking medication or remember to take your medication throughout the day. Um, just getting the diagnosis, though, um, there's stigma, first of all, in getting the diagnosis, but it's becoming a lot more understood now. Mm. Um, I, I'd like to thank TikTok for that. Um, it is, and, you're right, it is um, yeah. something that we see on social media, people really speaking up, even if they've just come to their diagnosis, uh, you know, later in life as an adult. Yeah, well, I, I got diagnosed um, about three years ago, oh, wow. um, after both my kids, and then I looked at myself and go, hmm, yeah, that sounds like me too. So um, I went and got diagnosed, um, but I was lucky that I had extended medical to go see a psychologist, mm. which is not something that is ideal general practitioners should be the ones who are, are diagnosing and prescribing um but there's a there's a study done in 2005 in bc here and 50 percent of gps felt uncomfortable diagnosing and um, mm. prescribing ADHD medications wow. and um they also did a report in 2009 that's called your attention please and uh there's not a heck of a lot that has changed. Um, there are more doctors who are becoming more aware. So there's definitely a lot of push for that, especially from um, psychologists mm -hmm. and doctors that, that know it, that live with it, who are really spreading it out there, um, which has been fantastic to see. I, I'm so happy wow. everybody's getting in there and trying to get it, get uh, more information out there to uh, professionals. And it's, the, yeah. it's so interesting that you've started your um, organization, your nonprofit, just in 2022. And already yeah. gaining steam, um, really raising that awareness. Chantel, yeah. thank you so much. Oh, I'll just have one more thing. Sure. We, we are doing a, an engagement for families um, about um, ADHD supports and services. Um, it, it has to do with the, uh, with the Ministry of Child and Family Development. It has to do with their changes to the family um, care centers or the SDCs or hubs. Um, because they had a program and it did not include uh, those with ADHD. And now they want to sort of broaden that scope and understand what it is that families need. So mm. if people want to come to our website, it's ADHD BC Society. And we're doing that with the Jonas Scratch from um, MCSD. So, yeah. Chantel, thank you so much for your call from Nanaimo. I should also mention we are actually giving away a couple of copies of the book, Queen Eugene is in Trouble Again. So for anyone who's calling in, our number again, 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. You are nodding along with that. Yes, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm familiar with the organization, mm. not that that 
you know, uh, I'm not involved with them, but I do follow them on social media. I found them a couple of years ago, and I know prior to that organization, there was nothing in BC similar to that. Mm. The, the organization in Toronto, the national one, has really been the only one. Wow. It's interesting. You were saying earlier that things certainly have changed since 20 years ago um, when your daughter was, was this age uh, in the book, but we're seeing more and more. Well, that was the thing. I actually had uh, the pleasure and I was lucky enough to go to a conference on ADHD in Canada and Calgary in the fall and I heard so many similar, to, uh, similar stories to mine. People not having resources, pulling out their hair, not knowing what mm. to do. Well, we actually have a, a doctor on the line with us now, um, who I believe you've seen speak. I did at that same conference. <laughs> at that same conference. Yes. So we have Dr. Gertie Parhar, who is a clinical professor at UBC's Faculty of Medicine and the medical director of the Adult ADHD Center. Dr. Parhar, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And, and can you tell me, you know, we just heard the story of someone who was just diagnosed just a few years ago. How common is that? Yeah, so even before that, Chris, uh, congratulations on your book. Thank you. Uh, we're all going to have uh, Queenie's Journey is a must read for all our patients <laughs> and uh, our staff. So um, congratulations. It's, uh, it's when we really do need more stories that are um, um, talking about ADHD and uh, sharing experiences. So congratulations again. Um, so you asked a really good question. And, uh, you know, uh, Chris was talking about resources in the education system. Your caller talked about resources in the community. Mm. And, and it has been a struggle, absolutely. And I can tell you, even from the medical system, I've been in practice for 30 years. And I think I had about 30 minutes of training on, on ADHD wow. in medical school and residency. And even then, when you think about the stereotypes, it was little boys that got ADHD, right? They were the ones, you know, there's even nursery rhymes put to this called Fidgety Phil. Fidgety Phil was a little boy who couldn't sit still and, and you know, was causing a ruckus in the class and his, and his teacher said, go get, you know, look into what has happened with Fidgety Phil. Now, interesting is that when you come out with that kind of training and that stereotype and those biases, what ends up happening is that we end up missing a lot of people with ADHD. Mm. Certainly little girls and young women don't always present like that. They're not always the physically hyperactive, a bit like Queen E. There's a lot of external distractions, but there's the internal distractions as well. So the inability to stay focused on something, getting distracted easily, being absent-minded, being daydreamy. And so a lot of young girls and women get missed over the years. That's why I'm delighted with Chris's book and Queenie's journey, because I think we need to stop thinking about those stereotypes because the medical community has been missing um, a lot of people who needed help, but particularly women. So to answer your question, um, a lot of women, a lot of men too, have been diagnosed a lot later in life now. And when we see them in the adult ADHD centers across Canada, um, you know, there's a lot of what could have been, should have been, would have been, mm. right? Um, because, and, uh, and a lot of times people will say, great, Dr. Parher, I'm great with the diagnosis now, but where were you when I was in grade three? Where were you when I was in grade two, mm. right? Um, so I think, I think that people coming to this understanding, and seven years ago, we weren't even talking about it. And now, as, um, Jean, as Chris said, you know, people are talking about it on TikTok and other areas. And that's great. I think the increased awareness is important, but there's so much more work to be done. I'd love to ask you, what now then, you know, for someone who's just been diagnosed, but we are actually getting calls from people uh, with lived experience. And uh, Dustin is joining us from Vancouver. Hi, Dustin. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Uh, tell us, um, you know, what uh, you'd like people to know about ADHD. Uh, well, I just find that sometimes, like, keeping that organization or the sorting, um, when it comes to that, their main when someone with ADHD has trying to get new projects sorted or anything, they have a fine hard time finding that organization to keep it clean or keep it in a certain area. So mm. when that organization is put in place ahead, say whether it's another person helping them, shelving the labeled boxes, somewhere where they can store their things, it does tend to help while have not having it ends up with that mess that most people see it as mm. and especially within schools and whatnot kind of relating to genie i always had a very messy desk and yeah it was always the cleaning but it was never it never stayed the same that since the clean and it would always go back to how it was right so so much of that accommodation or that preparation sooner helps yeah yeah that's a really good point dustin thank you so much for the call Great to hear from you. Amy is up next now in Cranbrook. Hi, Amy. What would you like to share about ADHD? Hi. Um, I was just diagnosed, oh, my goodness, three months ago. 
Mm. I believe. And it's, I mean, it's, it's it's been life changing in a way. Really? Yeah. I was diagnosed actually just because my, I have a psychiatrist, but my GP was thinking like, cause I dealt with um, persistent fatigue mm. and, you know, medications, tests, everything mm. was coming back normal. And it was um, his wife who's, a psychiatrist was like, well, you know, maybe ask her to go see her psychiatrist and get like the screening done, get the test done. Why and has so, it, you know, why has it been life changing for you to finally get that diagnosis? I mean, it answers so many questions I had growing up. Like Dustin from, I believe it was Vancouver, who was previously just on, he was talking about the organization and that prepping and the planning. And 100%, like I struggled with that when I was younger. And now being older, like I, firmly live by that of like having to know exactly what's going to be asked of me needed of me and so on to be able to move forwards with whatever project is coming up yeah how does this change things for you moving forward I mean hopefully I'll just be able to plan better for the future medication wise has been helping significantly it must be so validating as well Oh, it most definitely is. Yeah. I can imagine. Amy, congratulations. I'd like to say that because now you, you have the answers to all these questions, right? Oh, I do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for the if call. Could, yes, go ahead. I was I going to go just, to you, Dr. Bahar. Please. Thank you. Yeah. If I was just going to add, thank you for sharing that. And that is exactly it. You know, I see 20 to 30 ADHD patients on a daily basis. And I can tell you after 30 years of practice, nothing is as satisfying. People will say, you don't understand. I'm not that same person anymore. Oh. You know, I can make decisions. As, as the previous caller said, I can get things organized. I can get onto a path of improving. And we think about attention and we think about hyperactivity, but there's so many other things. People with ADHD often can't even get something started mm -hmm. because, because they're feeling exhausted on how much effort it's going to take. They have impulsive behaviors, you know, binge drinking, binge alcohol, binge eating. Um, they often have angry outbursts or emotional dysregulation. So ADHD isn't just about a hyper little boy or a little girl in the classroom. It's so much more than that. And I think that's what we need to understand. And because you only know your brain, you, your own brain, you don't know what the way the rest of the world lives. So when people get treatment, and not everybody needs medication, but once you get treatment for ADHD, you realize how much easier everyone else's life is. And you've been putting in all this effort we, we actually think that people with ADHD are putting in four times the effort wow. to accomplish the same thing as someone without ADHD. And can you now, imagine how exhausted? Oh, I, how I exhausted can, and she talked is. about that fatigue, yeah. right? Uh, it, yeah. This just opens doors for people yeah. and uh, and being able to recognize as well um, I, uh, their stories in Queenie Jean. Congratulations. And that's, thank you very much. And that was a big part of this too, in yeah. that I wanted to show the impact it has 24 hours a day. Yeah. It's not just during school hours, in the impact on the family. So great to have you both, Chris Reed and Dr. Gurdi Parhar. Queenie Jean is in trouble again is the book. Dr. Parhar is at UBC's Adult ADHD Club.